Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Absolve, O Lord, the souls of all the faithful departed from every bond of sin. Eternal rest give unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. The saints are known for their deep understanding of the mysteries of God. God likes to show his saints his secrets of time and eternity. A repeated theme among the saints is their abhorrence of sin and a true understanding of sin's effects and consequences in our souls and the world around us. God shows them these things. Some of the saints he even took down to purgatory itself and even hell. Thus, the saints would do more penance than most, and we're more willing to suffer to save souls than we are. May such saints be numbered among us as our true friends. For our worst enemies, and I don't think I speak wrongly here, I think I speak accurately, are truly our worst enemies, are not the Satanists. Our worst enemies are those who approve of sin and confirm souls in sin, especially if they wear a collar or a mitre. That is one of our worst enemies. To tell a pro abort a politician, you're okay, you can go to communion, it's okay. That is really bad. Because Of this spiritual knowledge and enlightenment, the saints often prayed to avoid purgatory. They understood purgatory better than we do. Thus, for example, St. Thomas More prayed, Grant me the grace, good Lord, to be well my sins and for the purging of them, patiently to suffer adversity, gladly to bear my purgatory here. I often like to read survival stories from all ages, shipwrecks, plane crashes, boat people, gulag imprisonments, and escapes. A number of things strike the reader. Suffering has a way of focusing man's attention on what is most important. He starts aiming at what is needed to be released from his trials. So it is with the poor and holy souls. They're highly focused. They're highly focused, waiting to be released and to see God face to face because they are greatly suffering and deeply in love and unable to unite themselves completely to the object of their love. Another point that strikes the reader is how those who undergo the trial wish they had a chance to be back in their normal environment to do things right. They can't help but think the reason they're in this trial is they did something wrong. As Alexander Scholzenitsyn said in the Gulag, the reason we're here is because we forgot God. That's why we're here, suffering in this Gulag. And they would not complain of their daily difficulties if only they were back home, had another chance. They would not mind, but would even be joyful knowing that things could be, oh, so much worse. The same is true of the poor and holy souls. They want to make amends for their past mistakes, as it were to do things right this time with great thanksgiving and love for their little sufferings that are nothing compared to the pains of their exile. Some even get a chance to do that. They're seen on the earth making reparation for their sins. I hope you see why I like to read these stories. They're very sobering and helpful when we feel down and out and feel like complaining about everything that's going wrong in our life. Go read a survival story. 
It will help. But I have noticed that modern man is so spoiled. He complains about nearly every inconvenience, and I count myself among them. He has all his needs and satisfied, it seems, and still it's not enough. How unhappy he is. I think this is on display in the recent Halloween yard spectacles. This year wasn't as bad as previous years. I think the China virus, the Wuhan virus, had an effect on him. But these yard displays, these spectacles of Halloween, I think one possible interpretation of these, of what we're seeing, is this. They are sort of mocking what they know might really happen, and they're afraid it might be real. It's better to laugh at it and mock it and belittle it as if they're in control. They're trying to belittle as a sort of fake scare, treating death and punishment as if it were not real. In other words, they're hoping that it's really not a true, painful, and ugly, permanent exile. Man knows deep down that justice must somehow be fulfilled. He who sows the wind reaps the whirlwind. The scales will have to balance sooner or later. And when they do, it will not be pleasant for that generation who did not follow the will of their creator and obey his laws. If you love me, keep my commandments. Again, turning to the saints, we find they had a clear vision of this balancing of the scales. And I would like to turn to St. Peter Damien. He's an 11th century father, as it were, one of the last of the fathers, if not the last father, along with St. Bernard. He's considered one, at least. Let's turn to St. Peter Damien as an example. He founded and reformed a number of 11th century monasteries, that lived primarily a strict hermit life. In his life, we find this description of his devotion to the dead. The office of the dead in Damien's congregation consisted of the entire Psalter divided into three sections of 50 psalms each. So they prayed all the 150 psalms every day. After each section, three lessons were recited. It must be noted that unlike earlier and even contemporary uses of the office of the dead, the one in question here was not associated liturgically with the canonical office. It was extra. They prayed extra. It was of daily precept for Damien's monks, however, that when two of them resided together in a cell, For an individual religious, it was customary to recite the entire Psalter from the living or for the living, and as much of the second Psalter for the dead as his strength or inclination would indicate or dictate. They prayed a lot. He goes on, this author, describing the life of St. Peter Damien. In this connection, it is also of interest to record Damien's charity towards the deceased members of his congregation. For each departed confrere, he prescribed extensive suffrages, including seven days of fast. I want to be a member of that congregation. Seven days of fast for the deceased confrere. Seven disciplines of 1,000 stripes each. 700 prostrations. 30 psalters. Once again, that's 150 psalms. Seven masses by each priest of the order, besides 30 masses celebrated solemnly, solemnly by the community. He would allow no deviation from this established custom and enjoined that it be persevered or preserved. They persevere in it, inviolate, for all time to come. Wow. Those are hermits that have spent their whole life serving the Lord, and that's what he did to get them out of purgatory. He cared about the beloved dead. 
Let's follow the lead of the saints here by taking purgatory seriously. And this we can do by, first of all, praying, sacrificing, and earning indulgences for our beloved dead in purgatory. Just by coming to this church tonight, say an Apostles' Creed, an Our Father and a Hail Mary, for the holy and traditional intentions of the Holy Father, and you can gain a plenary indulgence for the poor and holy souls. You can go visit a cemetery and just say, may the souls of the faithful depart of the mercy of God rest in peace, amen, and you can get a plenary indulgence. Pray, sacrifice, and earn indulgences for our beloved dead. Number two, knowing we will wish we had done more when God willing we join them down below in our death or after our death. Let's do that now. We will wish we had done more when we are there. Let's start wishing to do more now. The day is at hand. Let's use it. And finally, three, not complaining about our crosses here, but embracing them thankfully and lovingly as truly doable compared to those carried in that place of purgation below. Make the first words out of your mouth. I know crosses are distasteful. I know they're hard. Say, thank you, Jesus. I know I needed this. And then go to your pillow and yell into it. But at least start with a thank you. It will help bear the cross. Grant me the grace, good Lord, to be well my sins and for the purging of them patiently to suffer adversity gladly to bear my purgatory here. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.